she missed a penalty kick against China in the Algarve Cup and they lost that game. Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan once described Title IX as one of the most important pieces of education legislation in the history of the Republic. The passage of Title IX in 1972 triggered a revolution in women's athletics, the effects of which are abundantly clear today. By the early 1970s, women had come a long way on the path to equality. The Equal Pay Act was passed in 1963 and the country was in the midst of another feminist revolution. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, which outlawed discrimination, was passed soon after and in 1966 the National Organization for Women was formed. However, women still had a long way to go in athletics. They had few opportunities to participate in sports. Athletic offerings for women were typically limited to cheerleading and track and field. When I was a senior, we only had one choice, and that was um, track and field. Okay, there were 12 sports for boys. Football, basketball. Athletic scholarships for women were very rare. Many female athletes had to settle for playing in intramural, non-competitive leagues or clubs because their schools didn't offer the sport that they were interested in. In a wild attempt to steer women away from sports, many were told that competitive sports would damage their reproductive organs and hurt their chances of getting married. The, 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 the very discriminatory beliefs about women was that it was unfeminine to be um, athletic. Um, if you were athletic, you may have been a lesbian, and that was considered to be terrible because you weren't really womanly. People actually wrote scholarly articles saying that women were biologically not able to work in teams, that they were too self-centered. Women were often perceived as the weaker sex. It was thought that they didn't have the drive or stamina that many competitive sports required. Athletic competition builds character in our boys. We do not need that kind of character in our girls. If a school had a women's sports team, the rules of the sport were often modified so that women wouldn't have to exert themselves. Girls basketball was totally different from boys basketball. Uh, when I played girls basketball, uh, girls could only dribble twice. And the argument was we were too weak to be able to dribble across the court. Although Title IX has become well known for its impact on women's athletics, it did much more. Title IX states that no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity, receiving federal financial assistance. It went on to mention that schools needed to have proportionality between the student population and the number of students participating in athletics. Uh, basically, what it means is that if 49% of your school population is female, then 49% of the participants in extracurriculars should be female. The principal author of the legislation, Patsy Mink, a Democrat from Hawaii, was no stranger to discrimination. Turned down by 20 medical schools, Mink decided to pursue a law degree, but no law firm would hire her. She entered politics in order to fight for race and gender equality. In 1972, Congresswoman Edith Green, a Democrat from Oregon, who also valued women's issues and education and social reform, along with Patsy Mink, introduced Title IX to Congress. The legislation was signed into law on June 23, 1972, by President Richard Nixon. Title IX was originally intended to provide equal access to women in education. No one foresaw the tremendous impact it would have on women in sports until after it was enacted. Before Title IX was enacted, women could be turned down from colleges simply because they were female. For women that were interested in playing sports, a new world was opened up to them, one that was full of possibilities. No longer were they forced to watch from the sidelines. 
It opened doors for athletic scholarships and increased the number of women who graduated from college with an associate's degree or higher. Many schools were concerned about the amount of money that it would take to become fully compliant. They complained that they wouldn't be able to put as much money into the sports teams that generated revenue for the school. On May 20, 1974, Senator John Tower, a Republican from Texas, proposed the Tower Amendments in response to those complaints. It was designed to exempt revenue-producing sports from Title IX compliance. However, it did not pass. That same year, Senator Jacob Javits of New York proposed the Javits Amendments of 1974. This required the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to issue Title IX regulations to schools. This amendment, along with several others, was signed on May 27, 1975 by President Gerald Ford. It was known as the Title IX Amendments. Once the regulations were published and communicated to the public, people began to truly understand what Title IX would require. Schools and universities were given three years to comply with Title IX, and many people's reactions towards the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare's requirements were negative. Title IX placed a heavy burden on schools. They now had to find money in their budgets to create women's teams, hire coaches, and buy equipment, as well as find or sometimes build additional facilities for women to use. I first started uh, my career in education around the time Title IX started, uh, I was teaching and coaching. Title IX certainly had an impact on me as a coach and on the athletes that I was coaching. You know, all of a sudden, uh, we didn't have practice every day after school. Uh, there were, you know, budget changes. Uh, there were schedule changes. And to be honest with you, as a as a coach, um, that wasn't seen as a as a positive thing. I mean, all of a sudden, we would think things were changing. Uh, was uh, something that we had to adjust to. Uh, you know, as I looked at it after a short period of time, I knew it was the right thing and it was a good thing, but uh, it was different. Schools had to shift money from revenue producing sports to activities that would help them become compliant with Title IX regulations. Many have complained over the years that Title IX has caused reverse discrimination. Some colleges have argued that in order to fund additional women's teams, they've had to pull funds from their men's teams, thereby reducing athletic opportunities for men. Although several collegiate men's teams have filed reverse discrimination lawsuits in recent years, not one has been successful. The courts have never ruled that money is a good reason not to, not to follow the law. Due to increased interest in participation in women's sports at the collegiate and high school level, many professional women's leagues such as the WNBA were created in the 1990s. Title IX is a revolutionary piece of legislation that affects millions of women today. In the year before Title IX was passed, only 300,000 girls participated in high school athletics nationwide. Today, we have more than 3.15 million high school female athletes, a 945% increase. It has forever changed the way our society views women and female athletes. I can remember that very, very hot July day in 1999 when uh, Brandy Chastain stepped in to take that uh, penalty kick. It was a very important uh, moment for women in sports, for women everywhere, and for all of the men, particularly the fathers and the brothers and the sons who supported them. You know, that penalty kick won the World Cup for the U.S. women's national team, and everybody went crazy after that. But it wasn't just a win for U.S. women. It really was a victory for all girls. Uh, because young women like Brandy, who had benefited from Title IX, uh, was really demonstrating that the commitment we had made some years before was paying off. In one generation, we have gone from young girls hoping that there is a team to young girls hoping that they'll make the team.